So, just closing our eyes. <clears throat> and coming into this present moment. <coughs> One of the easiest ways to center ourselves is to come inside the body. Contact whatever feeling is predominant for you. Maybe a general sense of the body, perhaps the feet on the ground, especially if you're feeling a bit restless or fragile or you've not quite arrived. Sometimes the feet, just that sense of grounding can be really helpful to bring the energies down a little bit. And noticing how you've positioned your legs, whether they're really comfortable that way or you could adjust the feet perhaps to make the knees, take the pressure off the knees. Checking that the weight is evenly distributed between your thighs, your buttocks. Checking through the spine. Noticing if it feels good to just elongate slightly. Give, give a little bit more space between each vertebrae. And this can be very gently, without stretching or forcing. But just gently inviting the mind to find that space. Checking the position of your arms, your hands. Is there anything you can do to make them more comfortable and relaxed? <clears throat> and allowing your body to give you feedback. Respecting the way the body wishes to sit rather than pushing it around. It's okay to cough if you've got a tickle in your throat or sniff if you need to. Maybe checking the shoulders, see if there's any tension that could be released. And noticing the position of your head. And maintaining contact with the body, with the sensations, the sitting posture. See if you can remember what you've left behind. Noticing the absence of the office. The absence of the streets, the traffic jams conversations. Noticing the absence of the past, the absence of the future. As you allow the mind to gently settle into the here and now.
Let's see if you can notice the beauty of that simplicity where all the diversity of perception is left behind. Just quietly celebrating the simple stillness of this present moment with nowhere to get to, nothing to run from. You've already arrived. If it helps to deepen into this moment, you can use the breath. Allowing the breath to just naturally enter into the body through the nostrils. In its own time. And noticing the sensation of the outgoing breath. See if there's any difference between the energy you feel on the in-breath and perhaps the energy of release on the out. See if you can remain a silent witness to the breathing process. Without mastering or controlling the breath in any way. See if the breath can become a place where you can rest your mind. Perhaps the way you'd relax the body in a gentle waves on the sea. Giving your trust. to the breath as it comes in and goes out. Just grateful for this one simple breath. Not thinking about the next breath or the one just gone. Just delighting in the simplicity of each quiet, humble, peaceful breath.
whether your mind wants to stay with the breath or from time to time wanders away. Just notice your relationship to that. How are you regarding that breath? Are you holding it gently, with reverence, with respect? Or are you clinging onto it as mine, demanding that it stay? Can you make peace when the mind is not staying with the breath?
So as we're coming close to the end of the meditation, I'd like to invite you just to settle again back into the body. Maybe allowing the breath to fade, the perception of the breath. Fall off the center of your screen and just to feel again the position of the body sitting. How do you feel now? If there's a little bit more peace than when you arrived, just notice why that is. What kind of causes did you put in place to bring about that particular calming effect? If you, find, <coughs> if you find your mind is tight or tense, ask yourself, what do you want? And see if you can just find contentment in letting go of wanting, in appreciating the beautiful simplicity of this present moment. <coughs> so before we open our eyes to end the meditation, I'd like to invite you to just contact the beauty of your intention in coming to practice, in offering this gift of peace, a gift of quiet time to yourself. See if you can allow a sense of appreciation to arise. by offering myself this gift of peace and quiet, by giving myself the opportunity to develop kindness, gentleness. May all beings benefit. May all beings also experience peace and harmony within themselves.
I was actually planning to get you to do a little reflection in the beginning on your own goodness and generosity and virtue, but um, somehow it didn't happen. <laughs> so we need to maybe do that another time. Mm. I felt like calm was more important, than simple rest. So hopefully you feel a little bit rested now. So I'm quite impressed by the turnout because today's topic is, I always think, not very exciting. Maybe it seems that way to people. The protective power of virtue. I don't know. Maybe you don't come for the topics. (laughs) But sometimes we think we know what that's all about. We think, oh, virtue, ethics, morality. Sounds kind of stiff. Sounds a little bit tired, maybe. Perhaps like a list of rules, you know. But in the Buddha's teaching, virtue is something much more alive than that. Yeah, so the word sila is sometimes translated as virtue or ethics. Sometimes disposition, which is quite interesting, because that to me implies a sort of um, that, that your inclination of mind has developed to the point where it becomes your character, it becomes your disposition. You know, somebody who practices a certain way, the Buddha said, and frequently thinks and reflects in a certain way that becomes the inclination of their mind. So if we frequently think about thoughts of loving-kindness or thoughts of non-harm, thoughts of renunciation, after a while that forms who we are and how we behave in the world. So the Buddha said that virtue is not a list of uh, rules, you know, it's not uh, just a code of conduct even and do's and don'ts, but it's a training, it's a cultivation. So on the one hand, we can say that virtue is not to harm, not to do anything that harms or hurts ourselves or others. And that can be sort of general, broad definition, yeah, a kind of abstinence of creating harm and hurt in the world. But in uh, the Dhammapada, the whole path was described as to abstain from doing bad and to do good and to purify the mind. So there were these three aspects, yeah? Yeah. So to define virtue as only the abstinence is not giving the full picture. Virtue can also be a kind of beautiful, caring, tender cultivation of harmlessness. Yeah? Something that we actually um, put into practice in a positive way. So in the commentaries, I think, it defines um, the abstinence of um, not doing harm, such as not killing, not stealing, not lying, etc., as vadita sila, which means not to do. But there's also something called charita sila, which means active sila, in other words, to do. Right? So you have on the one hand not to kill, but the opposite of that, which is described very beautifully in the suttas, is to, um, the Buddha says, to lay down rod and weapon gently and to act um, for the compassion and welfare of all beings. Compassionate for you know, protecting the life of all beings. So it's something a lot more um, alive, a lot more creative than simply, you know, not squishing a cockroach, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of the opposite, you know, rather than you squish the cockroach, you actually see the cockroach is in the way of maybe somebody else or maybe a car or a bicycle. Here we don't get too many cockroaches, but we get spiders and, I don't know, other insects in the house. So what about moving them out of the way instead? Right? So it's not enough just to leave them be, but actually to protect and to care for these creatures. In um, the forest refuge where I've just spent a month on retreat, they had this very nice little um, thing called a IRS. It sounded very fancy. Insect Removal Service. <laughs> and it was just like a little um, coaster with a sort of plastic cot on top. <laughs> and all around the centre they had these, you know, this insect removal service. And I thought it was really cute. And uh, I used it quite a few times and I saw people using it, you know, just kind of picking up a little insect. Everything's so sort of almost uber-controlled there. It's a very controlled environment. The temperature's on a certain number. <laughs> you always know how hot it's going to be in the Dhamma Hall. 77 degrees. It's like whoosh, really hot. Anyway, so there were never any insects in the way of people's walking and it was really nice because you felt there was this sort of communal sense of taking care. So the Buddha often talked to um, any group of people, first of all, about um, the benefits of generosity, the benefits of virtue of contentment, 
And it said he did this to gladden the mind, to uplift, to elevate, to beautify, and to bring joy to the mind, yeah? And often we don't really um, harness this capacity of reflecting on the beautiful, reflecting on goodness, reflecting on kindness, enough, yeah? But in the suttas it's talked about a lot, and, and it's one of the first happinesses that the Buddha talks about in the gradual training. Maybe some of you have read the little blurb that I had to write up yesterday, I just did it very quickly, um, about the gradual training, because this is what I want to sort of elucidate across these sessions. And um, it can sound a little bit like, okay, we've got to go to training, what is this sort of army or something? But the training is really a kind of progressive refinement of happiness. It's actually a training in happiness. It's a training in putting down the causes of suffering and putting in place the causes for our true happiness. You know, happiness is a bit of a uh, sometimes not very kindly looked upon word, especially in our culture, I think. It can seem a little bit um, superficial or trivial, like happy, happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> and we're not necessarily always happy. Sometimes we're grumpy, sometimes we're like irritated with just life. You know, um, but real happiness that the Buddha's pointing to is a happiness that comes from within, despite how we actually feel at the level of, say, sensations or emotions or moods. It's a deeper happiness that starts to come about through, first of all, our virtuous conduct. And this is something that we often don't notice, right? We think it's kind of normal to be reasonably decent members of society. But the Buddha said there's actually something there which he called a blameless bliss. Anavajasukha. And it's one of the first blisses of the gradual training. One of the reasons it's blissful is because you don't sit down to meditate and start thinking of all those terrible things you've said to somebody or, you know, the kind of disaster you could see waiting to happen but you didn't avert it. Or actually it happened to me the other day. Um, somebody walked past a bicycle which was like loosely tied to a lamppost and the bicycle fell sort of into the road. And in my mind, I, I saw this guy walk past, knowing what he'd done, and I was like, I can't believe he didn't pick that up, you know. And then this evening, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll mention that. And then I thought, oh, but I didn't pick it up either. <laughs> <laughs> so I've admitted that now. <laughs> but it looked kind of like the guy's wheel would probably get squished by a bus or something. So it was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> Apparently in law, they have something um, called an omission to act, so I don't know if there's any lawyers here who know much more than me about that, but basically it's the same principle, that it's not only enough not to do, it's actually sometimes a crime, a legal crime. Um, yeah, so it's not only enough to abstain from the unwholesome, but it can be a crime not to do things that you could have done. So, for example, they say you have a duty of care if there's, say, a contractual relationship, such as somebody's a doctor, right? Clearly a doctor has a duty of care to try to... Um, find the cause of the disease and then prescribe the right medicine and help that person come out of the sickness. Or there's a duty of care for a, a lifesaver yeah, who goes out in the lifeboat and rescues people from sea. Apparently there were programmes about this. I think my niece and nephew like to watch life-saving programmes about how they rescue little boats from really big storms. Um, yeah, or even there's something about when you have created a, a situation where there could be harm, such as maybe a traffic accident, and you do not try to help the person that's harmed through that. And these are actually um, punishable by law. But it, it brought to me um, the question of why does you know caring for other people have to be contingent on those things? Why can't we help people even if there is no legal necessity to do that you know can we actually help anybody who we see without walking away you know without just walking away from the person on the street who's asking for something to eat or maybe asking for a cigarette or asking maybe you don't have a cigarette but maybe you do or you know just wants a little bit of attention when you read you know or, or see reports about homeless people sometimes they say you know all we want is somebody just to smile at us like see that we're human beings like anybody else you know not necessarily falling into drugs or anything like that it can be people who just can't quite make ends meet you know and especially in america i think this is really common 
you know, can we actually be there for people and, and go that little bit further? The Buddha said, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. Yeah, so with a boundless heart should we develop loving kindness to all beings. So this virtue is a kind of, um, it's like loving kindness in action. Yeah, we can sit on the seat and develop loving kindness in our heart and it feels wonderful, especially if you really get into this. There can be a real sense of opening. But how do we manifest that in the world, you know? What's the point even of getting into deep samadhi, even enlightenment? If you're just as grumpy and miserable and selfish <laughs> in your daily life, you know, there's really no point, is there? I don't think there's much point. I mean, maybe you feel good, but it's not very inspiring to others. And I have met people who have supposedly developed deep meditation. And uh, one of them was a partner of a, an old friend of mine. And he was, he was hitting her in this relationship. And he even stole from her to buy alcohol. And this is somebody who would had like a good, te- a good teacher and had said, yes, you know, you got into the first jhana. It's like, what's the point? And actually in this kind of situation, the Buddha actually said, um, let me try and get the Pali, um, Sila Paribhavito Samadhi Mahapala Mahanisamso. It means that the stillness or the Samadhi that's developed on the basis of Sila, with Sila as the foundation, is of great fruit and great benefit. Mm. And this is repeated at the ordination ceremonies. Whenever somebody goes forth as a monk or as a nun, um, this is repeated to inspire, because what we're doing by taking the ordination is refining our virtue. We're taking on more and more training precepts. Um, Again, not rules, but ways to train to see all the areas in which our minds still try to be tricky and devious and deceitful. Yeah, or, or just try to get away with maybe a little bit less than our best, you know. So there are rules about, for example, um, being respectful. You know, if you're disrespectful, it's something you have to confess. So there's this beautiful kind of container whereby if we have behaved in ways that we don't find, yeah, sort of showed ourselves in our best light or maybe hurt another person, we have an opportunity to tell somebody else about it. So it's like a little check. It's not to be told off or like beat with a stick or nothing like that. My teacher said, if you've done something wrong, you have to stroke the cat. <laughs> Several times. I told him something I'd done a while ago and he said, oh, have you got... Um, a, a, obviously he knows I haven't got a cat. So then he said, have you got a teddy bear or something? <laughs> I said, I haven't even got a teddy bear. He said, anything soft. <laughs> then I remember I had this tiny little... Um, stuffed deer that somebody not a real one just like a little toy deer that somebody gave me at my ordination so I went and stroked this little <laughs> and it sounds really silly but you know I was teaching a meta retreat in um, in Devon in December and uh, and in the morning we'd always have a check in with the people on the retreat so we'd go around and just ask like how are you today and, and the sharing was fairly deep and I noticed it it deepened as the retreat went by and people felt safe, you know, in this beautiful atmosphere of loving kindness. And in the beginning, the deer would just stay on the table. People would be like, I don't really get that, you know. Or they'd hold it, but they'd just sort of put it there. And after a while, they were like talking and... (laughs) Yeah, and I felt like this and stroking this little thing and, you know, looking in its eyes. (laughs) It was really interesting just to see how... This became a way to soften, you know, and a way of connection in a way. But anyway, that's a kind of digression. But it's what happens when the heart gets soft, when the heart gets soft. Yeah, so this uh, first precept of not to kill is much so, so, so much more than that. It's actually a gift of harmlessness. Yeah, and the Buddha said that um, one who is uh, harmless is a true renunciate, is a true samana, like... Somebody really living the spiritual life. That doesn't only mean monastics. It can mean anybody on a spiritual path, you know, that's walking that path with sincerity. He said, one that harms another is not a samana. You know, they don't deserve that name. They don't deserve to be called the even one. It literally means the even one, the harmonious one. Mm-hmm. And this beautiful loving kindness is an important part of living um, harmoniously in community. Another word for virtue in the commentaries is samadhana, which means like uh, harmony or, um, there's another word for it, but it's a kind of evenness, a kind of balance. 
if you like, an integrity. Yeah? And in the suttas it often says that the way to live harmoniously with others is to have, for example, um, thoughts, deeds, and bodily uh, and verbal actions of loving kindness, both in public and in private. Yeah, so again, it's that sense of integration, that sense of harmony between you know, your actions and the way you actually think when you're alone, say, in a room. How do you think about a person when they're not in front of you? That affects the way you'll treat them when you next see them. He also said that one of the principles of living harmoniously is to share um, even the contents of your own arms bowl. It's obviously your plate. And in some cultures, I don't know, in the Middle East, probably in India, in many, many countries, you know, you can't have a meal and just sort of keep your own dish next to you, like guarding it. You have to put everything out there and you just take from everything and you all share it together, even with the fingers, right? People say it's not hygienic, but I think it builds up the immune system myself. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, there's this really beautiful sense that the most important thing, your very sustenance, is a a communal um, sharing. It's a gift that everybody partakes of you know and it's not uncommon for you to just invite anybody into the house as well you know you can just kind of turn up and you'll be fed yeah. in Burmese they um, say have you eaten for hello <laughs> have you eaten that means hello because it's the most important thing so we nourish our bodies and we share our food with others but even more important than that the Buddha said that um Sharing in common virtues with our companions is one of the principles of harmony. Mm? Also sharing in common um, our view. So our view of the world, if you like, again, our value system. He was talking here about right view, the right view of the Buddha's path, of the noble path. But it's interesting because I read something about... um, Um, divorce rates and the reasons for divorce and apparently the two most common reasons are like differences in um, core character so like core personality yeah so again you could say whether one's a virtuous person or or not and differences in value systems really interesting and these are the two things that you know generally cause breakups because it's so hard to reconcile those they're such a deep fundamental part of of who we are and how we feel good about ourselves, how we feel good and effective in the world. And it really hurts when people violate those principles, yeah? Or do things that we just can't agree with, can't really um, reconcile. So I did want to go through the precepts a bit, but there's never a lot of time. Not really the precepts, but again, um, just the beautiful side of these... um, (coughs) don'ts <laughs> um, so we've we've talked a bit about protecting life the next one is about not stealing <clears throat> so obviously the opposite side of that is generosity right and Bhikkhu Bodhi says that generosity is like the foundation and the seed of spiritual practice it's also the very thrust of spiritual life instead of trying to get trying to gain you know endlessly wanting, wanting, you know, what can I get? Greed. It's giving. It's giving away. It's giving of ourselves, of our time, of our qualities, sharing those qualities with others. You don't have to be rich to be able to share. I read a quote by Bob Marley. I think it's Bob Marley. He said, some people are so poor that all they have is money. (laughs) It's quite good. (laughs) We have so much more than that, you know. We have our ability to just listen and be present for another without judgment, you know. And in our meditation too, this ability to give our presence, give our attention to whatever's arising, rather than try and grab at certain states or certain experiences. We're trying to make our minds like this beautiful, wide open, spacious container that invites the beautiful in. So we invite the breath in rather than go out after it and kind of grab it in and say, stay with me now, this is my meditation. You know, there's a kind of craving in that, there's a sort of violence almost in that, right? It's not gentle enough, it's not compassion, it's not non-harm. 
So it's not one of the right intentions. The right intention is nikama, giving away, giving up. In a way, giving trust, giving trust to the process. And this beautiful um, quality of virtue starts off the process of meditation. The Buddha says, from virtue, one experiences non-remorse. You don't have to make an effort to experience non-remorse. It's natural that if you live a virtuous and a good life, there's no remorse. So the mind can settle easily. And then he said, if you have non-remorse, it's quite natural that joy arises in the mind. And this starts off this gradual process of increasing happiness in the meditation. But there's a few little things you can do to kickstart it as well. And one of them is this reflection on one's goodness, reflection on generosity, or any little act you've done where you've not harmed another, or you've actually you know, smiled at another person, or done something really beautiful that you didn't have to do. It doesn't have to be much, but you know, if we can just think of something you know, that we feel pleased about, or that we can value in ourselves, maybe a quality that we feel is developing nicely in ourselves, or that we appreciate about ourselves, yeah? And it's not about getting into self-view or anything like that. It's actually the opposite. It's actually seeing that these things are present, you know? Let's acknowledge that. Let's recognize it. Because by doing so, we may start to understand the cause for that to arise. And this is the whole point of Buddhist practice, right? That we start to understand the causes for happiness, the causes for suffering, and start to feed the causes which are going to bring the happiness about. Yeah? Yeah? So these practices are really nice and it takes a bit of time to get used to them, but we will do them together at some point. It just didn't quite happen tonight. <laughs> so, and then the next one after the um, giving is, uh, is about the speech. And this is such a big topic, I think I probably should do a whole um, session on this because it's not just about not lying. The Buddha said it's also abstaining from false speech, but also um, malicious speech and... Yeah, harsh speech and gossip, right? So kind of, yeah, backbiting it obviously includes and, and just sort of speech that wastes people's time that's not particularly productive or really leading anywhere. The Buddha said he praised the speech about things like contentment, simplicity, virtue, again, because this kind of talk uplifts the mind. He said that right speech is speech worth recording, speech which beautifies the heart, that opens the heart, that brings together people who are divided, and that reconciles differences. Yeah? And even more than that, I think, especially um, with so many difficulties in the political arena now, or with various marginalised groups, and you know, maybe the rise of hopefully not the right-wing sort of side of things, it's so important sometimes to speak out against these things, you know, to be an ally to the marginalised, you know, not just say, OK, we welcome everybody, but actually to, to prove that, to show that, and to make them feel fully welcome. It's really nice being in Oxford, because you see these um, um, LGBTQIA flags everywhere, the rainbow flags, they're just all over the city. And I think that must be so beautiful for people coming here, you know, from any kind of uh, marginalised group in, you know, LGBTQIA+. Plus, we have to have the plus, because it's really inclusive, right? It can include everything. Uh, Jen Brown always says it should be C for celibate as well. (laughs) We work on that one. He says, I demand my right to be celibate without being seen as weird. (laughs) It's a bit weird. (laughs) But that is different. I mean, you know, you can argue that's different because it's a choice, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's just very lovely to be able to use our speech in those ways. You know, Martin Luther King said, um, it's not the words of our enemies we'll, we'll remember, but the silence of our friends. Mm. You know, because when we're silent, we're colluding. Mm. You know, and it takes guts to speak up. It takes a lot more strength, more inner strength. You know, I'm not suggesting we always do it or... You know, and again, we have to be very gentle with ourselves. We can't change the world, you know. We're not always in a position to be on the front lines of activism. And I don't think it'd be healthy to be, because we need to resource ourselves, you know. We need to touch base and check, okay, is my motivation still aligned with the path? Or am I moving too far into anger, too far into greed and wanting the impossible? You know, so we have to come back and say, okay, 
you know, let me resource, freshen, nourish myself so that I'm clear enough to see where my energy is best placed to be, a, you know, effective, to be of service. You know, maybe it's the climate catastrophe. I can't really call it change anymore. It's a kind of crisis. Maybe it's, you know, in, in women's rights or in LGBTQIA plus C rights <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, wherever you feel drawn because we can't do everything. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, it'd be great if I could also start going out with Extinction Rebellion, but it's impossible. You know, I've already got a monastery on my hands, which is the work of at least 10 people, seriously. Um, and I work hard, so I'm not just complaining that it's hard. <laughs> Um, so we do what we can but we do need these places for people to come together also and feel like we can be with spiritual friends with people who share our values and our um, you can call them belief systems but to me it's just um, kind of a commitment to being kind and to bringing forth the best we can in the world Um, places where people feel included and safe and free from harm and danger it's nice being a nun sometimes because even though people might not necessarily respect you, they usually don't give a damn what you're wearing or, <laughs> you know, the word venerable sounds all very odd as well because it sounds like, huh, are you some kind of queen or <laughs> <laughs> but that's just a little sort of gender equity thing because in the monks monasteries, the monks are always called venerable it's in Pali so you don't know but the women are called sister so there's a difference <laughs> so that's why I just use that word it's very gender neutral and it's universal and it's non-hierarchical because all monastics are called venerable whether you've been ordained a day or 20, 40, 60 years you're venerable anyway, diversion but uh, what was I saying oh yeah, the idea of being a nun is um, yeah, you don't always uh, it's not always appreciated necessarily but one thing that I haven't um, experienced is that anybody responds with fear most people understand this is someone who's chosen a harmless life including animals actually animals um, can sense when when you're a person who won't cause harm there was a nun in Perth and uh, she told me about the kangaroos which are completely tame well not completely but quite tame in the monastery and they come very close but she said they actually followed her (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she's very tiny and petite and very gentle um, probably about the same size as most of those kangaroos <laughs> so I just had this beautiful image of them sort of following her around <laughs> hopefully she wasn't feeding them, I don't know But anyway, so that was about the speech and as I say there's a lot more to say and I think really we could do with a whole session but um, just to end on with the speech Um, there was something I read out this morning as a reflection which again um, kind of comes into line with what I was saying about speaking up because the Buddha didn't say we should only say positive things he actually said that one should scrutinise and investigate and after doing that should speak praise of things worthy of praise not speak praise of things worthy of dispraise should speak dispraise of things worthy of dispraise and should not speak praise of things worthy of dispraise. And I thought this was really interesting because, yeah, well, yeah. (laughs) So basically, I think in Buddhism, we often feel, or some people feel, that we mustn't say anything negative about other people. We mustn't sort of say bad things, you know, negative things. But the Buddha actually said that we should use our investigative ability. We should scrutinise situations, people's behaviour. And we should learn to praise what's worthy of praise and dispraise what's worthy of dispraise. Hmm? Not praise what's worthy of dispraise and not dispraise what's worthy of praise. So we have to know, in a sense, what is worthy, what is good and, and ethical and beautiful conduct and what is not, and actually say this, be clear about this, you know. Because it's all too easy to try and say, well, yeah, everybody's, you know, great and everybody's lovely, really. And maybe true, but some behaviour is not praiseworthy. So rather than blame the person, we blame the behaviour. We actually point out (coughs) this behaviour is not praised by the wise, it's not leading to 
welfare and benefit for yourself or other people and to point that out. Yeah. So I think that's really important, you know, as a part of right speech. Otherwise it's too easy to sort of gloss things over or to feel afraid to come forward when there are tyrannical leaders, for example. Yeah. And there's always this question in monastic life, like, should we get involved in politics? I mean, I don't think we should get involved in politics, but I don't see what's wrong with pointing out behaviour that is unethical or policies which are going to create further division and harm, you know, or really disadvantage the weaker members of society. I think these are principles of, you know, just being a decent citizen that we want to care for the weakest among us, right? I mean, that's my personal view, and everybody has their own opinion as to how that's best achieved. But I think pointing out the principles which are in align with the Buddhist teachings are important. For me, it's important. Um, and I don't need to get into names, you know. It's not about the person, it's about the policy. <coughs> so just to sum up before we open for discussion, um, I've talked a bit about the, uh, the verbal and the bodily conduct, but also just to see how the sila protects us in our practice and how the practice of meditation can help <coughs> to deepen the sila. And uh, one way is also to start looking at what our minds are doing. So it's not only about um, the way we speak, the way we use our bodies in life, but also the way we look at things, right? So the Buddha called this like guarding the senses. Sometimes you might read it in the Noble Path under right effort, yeah, right effort, right endeavor. So it's about noticing um, ways we use our minds which are leading to unwholesome qualities and on the other hand, learning to use our minds in ways which generate wholesome qualities. So this starts to get into the field of perception. So for example, I see somebody who irritates me or who I don't like, and who, when I see them, I just start developing negativity. The Buddha said, yes, sure, that's one part of you know, what you see, but there are other parts to that person. So can we use our minds and use our perceptions in ways that also notice the things that lead to more positive mind states in ourselves, right? So, for example, I might also notice that that person who irritates me is very kind to their children, right? They take their children out on weekends and they're a really good father or mother. Yeah, maybe that person didn't say the bad thing I expected them to say this time. Maybe they were even quite polite, yeah? If you can't see that, maybe that person's suffering. Maybe there's a reason that that person behaves this way. You know, something didn't happen for this person or they were treated badly in their childhood. Whatever it is that gives them the benefit of the doubt and that basically stops us generating so much negativity that it it then becomes an obstacle in our practice. So, I mean, this gets into the sort of deeper side of, of Buddhist practice because you can say that all perception is conditioned, right? we perceive the way we have been conditioned to perceive things. So none of it, in a sense, is really true. But if it's not really true and really clear and accurate, why not use our perception in a way that brings about wholesomeness, that brings about goodness and happiness for ourselves? Because that's the best way that we can be effective in the world. And at a deeper level for our meditation, it helps us to overcome the five hindrances. Yeah? And we need to overcome these five hindrances to really deepen in the practice. So when these five hindrances start to become undermined, you know, the craving, aversion, doubt, restlessness, sleepiness, these are the general the way the Buddha describes them, then the mindfulness starts to become stronger and we can really see what's going on, the way our minds are working. And for myself, when I did my first retreat, it was interesting because I noticed things I'd never really noticed before. One of them was that um, I can only have a bad thought or a bad intention if I'm feeling kind of irritated or greedy or delusional, you know. I can only really act in a way that's harmful if I have defilements in my own mind, you know. And, And if I'm feeling good about myself and the mind is full of loving kindness, full of compassion, there's no way that I can actually act in a way that will hurt or harm others. Maybe somebody gets hurt or harmed, you know, um, unintentionally, but I I cannot generate, you know, a, a negative attitude that would bring about more suffering in the world. 
So it really starts within, you know, and the more mindful you become, the less willing you are to compromise on your own well-being also by generating negativity. And it was interesting for me that after my first retreat, I didn't make a commitment intentionally to, to Sila, to virtue. So before that, I used to go to the odd full moon party and, you know, enjoy that and, and listen to lots of music. And I mean, not really things which are against the Sila, but, um, but after my first retreat, I just found that all those kind of um, things which I suppose were not helpful for my practice started to fade away just naturally. Mm-hmm. You know, and the sila did start to purify. My conduct did start to purify. And it was really incredible because I didn't try to make that happen. It was more that there was a different sense of contentment inside And I think I was much more aware of where my mind was moving into negativity. And I was able to sort of not follow that train of thinking. So all these things strengthen each other. And the seal is such a fundamental part of practice, you know. It's about integration. It's about really learning, you know, how to apply our meditation in everyday life in ways that support others and protect ourselves and protect our practice. So I think that's enough for me and um, I would like to give the opportunity for a little bit of uh, discussion or any questions or comments or complaints. (laughs) And if some people have to leave early, that's fine. Don't feel bad about that. (laughs) Do you have something? Yeah. I was just wondering um, what you were talking about at the end about ways of seeing another person in a positive light and then how that fits in with the, um, the mindful speech of, of not pray, of, of dispraising what mm. is worthy of dispraise mm-hmm. and how to kind mm-hmm. of discern when we should okay. do one or the mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my instinct is to say that it's really good to work at the level of guarding the senses first, so that is learning to perceive in ways that undermine our own negative reaction to a person. Because when we have a negative reaction, it's very unlikely that we can dispraise somebody in a gentle way and in a way that's very helpful. We're much more likely to bring um, anger, negativity, irritation and other unskillful things into it, and that won't help the person. So I think that's an ongoing practice, the sense of restraint. It's, it's getting into the field of um, meditation already. So it's quite an advanced practice, in a sense, and something that can go hand in hand with mindfulness. So that's always important, because we're trying to protect our own mind through that practice. It's not about getting a realistic picture of the person, it's just about guarding our own mind from things which will come in and, and, um, and generate suffering for ourselves and generate negativities that we then have to spend hours on the cushion to overcome. So the praising what's praiseworthy and dispraising what's dispraiseworthy, um, that is always about the behaviour, not about the person. So we don't have to feel good about the person or bad about the person. (laughs) It's kind of separating the behaviour from the person so that it becomes much less personal and, again, less likely to offend. And also the Buddha gave some advice on how to give feedback and he said there were five things you have to check before giving feedback. So the first one is um, uh, the right time. So it has to be the right time. So you can't just tell somebody when you feel like telling them. If they're, say, in a fragile or vulnerable or, like, they're sick or tired or really busy, it's not the right time. Maybe it's in public. That's also not the right time because it embarrasses them or, you know, it's just mean. So the right time. It can also mean the right time for you that you make sure you check in with yourself and you know you're coming from a good place. But the next one covers that, which is um, you should be motivated by loving kindness. The next one is to do it in a way that's gentle. So the speech should be gentle. Um, The next one is that it should be for the person's benefit. And then, mm, what's the other one? Um, 
it sh- yeah, gentle, loving kindness for their benefit. And I think the benefit one can be extended to say it should be like related to the practice, pretty much. Like related to really what's in their benefit, <laughs> rather than just you didn't clean the toilets the way I like you to clean them. <laughs> or like, for goodness sake, why do you always do blah, blah, blah. It's not really, it's kind of trivial. Um, oh yeah, and another place, I, I, I'm actually not sure whereabouts this is in the suttas, but in some place it says that you shouldn't criticise others for things that you do. Mm-hmm. So you should be free from that fault yourself before telling someone else about theirs. Um, so I don't know that it means you have to be completely free from it, because none of us are completely, but yeah, it's about always checking in with yourself first and not being too quick to start correcting others. Yeah. But when I was talking about the dispraise in the reflection, I was thinking in more abstract terms, I think, rather than going to a person necessarily and just dispraising certain behaviour generally. And I think that can be done almost any of the time, as long as you're not rolling in, again, negativity. Yeah. Yeah. In in Vita Bodhi's book, there's um, training on personal and social. Yeah. Um, Coming social on social harmony. harmony yeah. yeah. I read something this week about personal um, uh, action or something, personal training, where he says that the Buddha said not just to not do the things which yeah. you know the, the the we call them the harmful acts or but also to sort of call people out for doing them and to praise people who have yeah. done them and that those are the three key elements. And I hadn't really thought of that before. I mm. always just thought about it as like me not doing things or doing things. Uh-huh. And I hadn't made a link with the uh, yeah. proactive sort of encouraging of others or yeah, discouraging of yeah, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit, um, yeah, yeah, that's a really important one because I mentioned about the Chargano Sati, which is like um, bringing up the good things that oneself has done as a way to sometimes start the meditation can be really good like to reflect on on the beautiful qualities or the things you've done like for example I can reflect on the fact that I'm starting to trying to build a monastery and yeah I can look at the workload but sometimes I can also reflect on the deep purpose of that and get some joy coming up but as well as that there are several places in the suttas where the Buddha um, there's one example of three monks who lived together in harmony and they were considered like the model of monastic harmony and they used to reflect on each other's goodness too so they'd say to themselves what a great gain it is for me what a great gain that I'm living with such virtuous companions in the holy life and they'd reflect in this way inwardly but I'm pretty sure that they would tell each other about that too and, and express that sense of gratitude and appreciation and that's really important and it, I mean, you only have to try and do that with people. I make that quite a habit, as much as I can, um, to find how resistant people are to accepting any sort of appreciation or gratitude. <laughs> like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. You know, I didn't, no, no, it's nothing. It's nothing. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and it's actually quite hard for people to hear it. So apparently there's been some kind of psychological psychology study that says it takes about 20 or 30 seconds for you to actually absorb something positive but about two seconds to absorb (laughs) something negative so I kind of think that's about the proportion we should also be doing and not calling out people on the negative stuff very much at all because I think we tend to already have that voice inside us that calls us out on that constantly even when it's nothing you know, I know I have that because I did something in the newsletter like I didn't change the date. So I did change the date actually, and it said 2020, but I obviously didn't press save, and so the newsletter came out in November 2019 today. And you know, and I can really see how it's not even that that matters, but it's the fact that I should have checked that it was saved, you know, and I want to kind of give myself a bit of a just a bit, you know, a bit of a slap on the wrist. Mm. Uh, it's just crazy <laughs> so I think yeah go steady on the dispraise <laughs> generally speaking mm. yeah and keep it to the behaviours yeah <laughs> can I comment on that? sure I mean I've noticed sometimes when you know that someone has a 
tendency, you know, some repetitive behavior that you don't like, and then you say, especially if they know that you don't like it, and praising that they didn't do it. Ah, yeah, yeah, So right. thank you for not okay. you know, taking out your anger on me or whatever. And, and, I, and that, I've noticed also, has, from personal experience, seems to come. Ah, uh, yeah. So you're not just praising that they did something, you're praising that they did it hard. I say yeah. that, right? Yeah, that's, that's what you meant. Been, yeah. I think, yeah. it's like, disseminates a lot of positive energy. That is really true, because then even if they're still angry ten times out of nine, you you point out the one that they weren't, and then they might also feel like, oh, great, she noticed, it matters, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Was there someone over there? No. Yeah. Yeah, I keep going on about the same thing, I think, every okay. time we have a... Um, session, but um, um, my topic in terms of virtue is much more systemic, um, and I feel it's like we're sort of addressing a microcosm of person-to-person -person relations, friends, and, and maybe our immediate community, but um, the trouble that I perceive in my life and the suffering that it causes in me is about... Um, you know, the clothes I'm wearing that might be coming from Bangladesh and the children made, or the, the plastic fiber in my clothing that is entering our drinking water, or, you know, the supply chains that, yeah. that, um, that cater to my needs, but um, cause immense suffering very far away, and I don't know about it. Yeah. Um, I feel like living in the society, there is, um, I'm, I'm part of a system where I don't really know how to live an ethical life living in that system. Yeah, I struggle yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and looking at the political landscape that uh, enforces mm -hmm. that. So, um, I assume, I mean, the Buddhist teaching came out of a time that were, in that, in that respect, much simpler, um, in terms of supply chains at least, mm. or no globalization, no plastic, no fossil fuels. Um, but we have to reckon with these things. How how can we amplify his teachings yeah. to the world, to the complex world we're living now? Why don't you go into politics? <laughs> Why don't I go into yeah. politics? It just came to me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, it's not a change I want to make in my yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a change you can make in other people's lives. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to put that on you as a serious personal question, but I guess it just came to mind because there are different fields in which we can work. And I mean, I don't know that this is only one-to-one -one interaction because we're all working in bigger fields. You know, you may be a social worker or you may be working in the NHS or you may be working in government or you may be working in, I don't know, supplying stuff that's made in Britain or, you know, locally made produce or whatever. There are all kinds of fields in which we can work in to try to take away the energy that we give to those more systemic, bigger corporate monsters or whatever. <coughs> but I guess, I mean, what I hear from you, I get it. And I also feel kind of, if I think about it, that would really bother me deeply. But I can only cause change in certain fields. I can't cause change in all those fields. There might be some jobs you can do which have a bigger impact. That's why I thought of politics, because that is the big picture, isn't it? I suppose it's people in those fields that have a chance. But, my goodness, look at politicians. I mean, it's very hard to even get into politics, I think, without becoming slightly corrupt mm -hmm. and having to make ethical compromises. Mm -hmm. You know, even the best intention of politicians have to still do something about defence or some sort of immigration check or something, you know. It's, it's almost impossible to take on and change the whole world and I think this is a systemic problem but it's also an existential problem and the Buddha did absolutely address the suffering at the extent, existential level. I mean, that's why his description of suffering was so pervasive it wasn't just about the suffering between individuals or the suffering within our own mind. It was the suffering of being born, the suffering of being alive, of being conscious. You know, and he gave a path to end all of that, to actually end all of that. I mean, that is what he did. 
And that's why I'm a non, because I really don't see another way to stop avoiding harm completely other than by not contributing to this at all, if you like. But the path toward that has to start with what we can do now, <laughs> and it has to start in the one-to-one and in the oneself with oneself, because it's just too much to take on the rest. And I think if we do try to, when we don't have the inner strength, I mean, someone who's really advanced on the path can do more, like they serve more and more and more, the more established they become but until we are then it can just get us so down that we become unable to to bring that to actually decrease the suffering because we're just getting consumed by the suffering so I don't know I mean there's many things we can do obviously at all those levels but it will never be that much as an individual so I guess finding what's most important maybe finding one area that's most important. I mean, like, you can shop, you know, don't buy things from China or Bangladesh, but maybe go further up the higher, you know, go further up and start to work in various fields. I don't know. I don't know. But just to, but what does non harm then mean to us? In, is, it, it becomes a very great Minimizing area, harm? So relatively non yeah. harm. Yeah, minimizing harm. Yeah. yeah, I would say so, yeah. Minimizing and being happy with the minimizing that you've done rather than looking at all the things you haven't been able to do because that's going to be more. But the, min- the small things we do are huge, I mean, they can change people's lives. I-, I think it's important not to underestimate the small things that we can do, otherwise, where are you going to find any happiness and peace? I don't know. I mean, I think I'm in it with you. I think, you know, it's not something I know either. It's just that I know I have to do my best to bring a bit of happiness into the world, a bit of kindness, and minimise the harm that I do in the best way I can. Like, I don't buy anything from Bangladesh. I think what you're saying resonates with me on the point of why why not become politicians, for example. I think if you were to become a politician, it would mean to um, presuppose that you have the answer somehow. Mm. Questions. And maybe what you're pointing out is that it's so complicated and so interlinked because there's no obvious way to apply the praise versus dispraise. I mean, say, oh, I, I can make, I can make a, a difference by buying one particular brand of shoes. It's, often not always that, that simple. But then I also appreciate what you're saying in terms of we can at least alleviate suffering at an individual level. Just for yourself, you can alleviate your own suffering. And whenever you think about these things, whenever your mind goes off and you're worried about people in Bangladesh, I mean, that is ultimately you that's suffering in that, in that mindset, to some extent. And by Returning to the present moment, that's, that's a way that what you can alleviate in some suffering, perhaps by teaching, by spreading mm. those teachings, we can alleviate suffering. Yeah. I mean, I, don't, I, have, I have never and hadn't wanted to sort of suggest that it was all about one's own suffering only. You know, it isn't. It's about alleviating one's suffering to the point where we're able to... Um, develop compassion and love and kindness in greater quantity so that that will then spill out into our choices or into the work, you know, the livelihoods we choose or whatever. I suppose the difficulty, I have, the difference or the difficulty maybe that I have with this sort of um, looking at the massive systemic problem is that we can only ever do. A, do a small amount as an individual you can't change the whole world as an individual so I guess we have to like resource ourselves as much as we can and then choose where we want to put our energies and how we want to put them but by getting depressed by what we're not doing isn't going to help us to be more effective in what we are doing um, I think that's the problem really not, not that we should only focus on ourselves and reducing our own suffering but how to 
be able to hold that suffering and still, with a heart of loving kindness and strength and courage, go out and live a virtuous life in whatever way we can. Because you know? we are social beings and we are part of a system and a structure and a global structure now. Um, yeah. Mm. So it has to apply to all of that. Also thinking of looking at it also from a different view, mm. like you were talking about humans. I mean, fossil using fossil fuels is bad, but we have electricity, right? Like there's also a benefit that has come from all these evils. Yeah, and I yeah. think even just kind of recognizing mm. some of that and realizing that that's been really important. For us, the net benefit might have been very negative and harmful, but there are positives that have come from this that mm. have really helped, whether it's I don't know, electricity that keeps vaccines that saves children's lives or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, so I think kind of keeping mm-hmm. that in mind might help alleviate a little bit the fact that we're part of this larger systemic problem and that we're involved in it because there are some really, you know, positives that have also come yeah. with this. Yeah. So maybe that just kind of reduces a bit of the anxiety perhaps mm-hmm. personal. I don't know if that helps, but I think... Yeah. Is it, uh, it just... Uh, I, I don't want to, because I'm in the same space, I'm always thinking about the harm that we, in our privileged lifestyles, are exerting on the planet and other people. But it just occurs to me that it is, it feels sometimes like there can be a bit of a kind of objectification of that. Um, and they're kind of clinging to this kind of thing, oh, you know, um, if I do this, it's going to be bad. And this, this week I've done, I've emitted this amount mm. of carbon. And, and you know, you, it just becomes kind of, it can actually just become a bit, um, I think I do get a sense that it can be, and I, I notice it myself, you can kind of get into this thing where, where, you're thinking about all this kind of objectification of, of stuff and you're actually starting to lose contact with people mm. because you're so obsessed with, you know, and also I, I do notice this, you know, I kind of just yeah. kind of like all these, you know, you can get into this thing where I care about this stuff but all those people out there, they don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it can become, yeah. it can really easily become a bit out of, yeah. Been in the wrong place. I can't really yeah, characterise yeah, yeah. it right. Totally, because it's like you're losing empathy for what's mm-hmm. right in front, mm-hmm. and yeah. thereby lo- missing opportunities to bring some kindness or some mm-hmm. joy to others. In a sense, it becomes a bit. Mm. Yeah. 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 But just recognising that is already mm-hmm. a great start, yeah. isn't it? I was like that yesterday. I was just like in my suffering. Oh, even even this didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I had to meet those feelings, right, and work with them. And then today, I was a, a lot more open again. And there was a certain sense of vulnerability and softness, and even a bit of humility. Like, okay, I go through it sometimes, you know. I even bothered my teacher with it, so you know. Never mind, he'll forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you start again, and it's like, okay, so then how can I be kind, and what's right in front of me? And, <laughs> and I just think it's a constant sort mm. of learning to be flexible and soft with those dynamics. And maybe try and see there's something beautiful in that caring, you know? It's not like just a negative and struggle thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a quality of really caring. So just, you know, maybe try and get at what's underneath it, like the beautiful thing that's underneath it, and bring that out somehow in your life. I think you have to exercise that, otherwise you'll just feel, like, totally uh, defeated. You know, which is why I'm just trying to say, like, notice the things you do do, because there are a lot. I mean, you came Mm -hmm. to meditation. I mean, everybody here is sitting here basically sharing goodness. They are, you know, I mean, you're all good people. I don't think anybody's going out into jobs that are like, I don't know, you're probably not making atomic bombs or, (laughs) you know, I mean. 
So we have to find some happiness in that. Yeah. I find it quite difficult to um, to deal with the fact that <coughs> other people don't um, do the same as you do. Mm. Um, so I had this um, this problem a few weeks ago. Um, I'm a vegetarian for the simple reason that I don't agree with how um, animals are treated and how they're killed. So. Um, I don't force people to think that way. I just, you know, if someone wants to eat meat, that's fair enough. We're, you know, it's human, we eat meat, etc. But I was really, really upset yeah. with um, all these, um, I don't know the name for the place where you kill the animals, what's the name? Oh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really upset with all these things going on. You've got loads of videos showing that it's terrible. And it's so how do you, how do you um, decide when, um, like I was really, you know, I was so upset and I wanted to stop people from buying that meat. But then it's difficult because then you enter in a, in a place where you're trying to force people yeah. to think the same way as you, but you're convinced that you're right because yeah. you think it's terrible. And I related to what you were saying about buying clothes in Bangladesh and all that. And I didn't know what to do. I wanted to cry, but that wasn't going to help. Yeah. And I was just thinking, I think the most important is to get the information yeah. and spread it. Yeah, yeah. That's all you can do, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. force people to think yeah. the same way as you do, because right. that's not right, 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 and it won't work anyway. So I was just thinking, I'll get the information, and I'll spread it. And yeah, I'll just, yeah. You know, have a yeah, yeah, yeah. And at least you know. Yeah. And yeah, I guess it's a bit the same mm-hmm. for um, clothes in Bangladesh. I've stopped buying new clothes anyway. I just buy second hand things. So I suppose that's a way already to not solve the problem but minimize mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And sometimes you harm others without knowing too. Sure. Um, a few weeks ago, I discovered that. Coconuts were picked up by monkeys <laughs> who were, um, well, tortured to learn how to do that. I didn't know. So I see what you mean. How do you not harm when you don't know who you are? So again, I think it's important to try and get the information. Mm. That's really all you can do. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. You just threw in coconuts for me. Sorry. You just threw in coconuts for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but also there's two reactions you can have when you find out about the monkeys. One is to feel terrible about all the coconuts you've eaten, and one is to think this is so good because now I can not eat them and I won't be harming yeah. all those monkeys. Yeah. That's why I'm, I'm saying that yeah. I'm saying that I think getting the information. Yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. That's all you can really yeah, do. yeah. And I think you came to that because you didn't act on those feelings because it's when we're like going through the suffering that that's when we feel a bit less balanced, and that's when you want to start telling everybody like please don't do it, and it is because the mind has not yet processed those feelings, and I think it's okay to cry, actually, I mean, when you said it's not going to help, I think it's a natural part of going through um, your feelings (laughs) and making peace with those in order to come to a place which is then more sensitive, it's like the more we are able to open to the suffering, the more chance there is for genuine compassion to arise, and from there we make a deeper commitment to living a life of non-harm, out of compassion rather than out of anger or suffering. Mm-hmm. Well, that was the difficult bit. Yeah. Accepting that I wasn't going to force people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it took me a while. Mm. Now I'm okay, I can't do it, so I can yeah. people. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. It's difficult, mm, it's difficult. yeah. That's beautiful. I'm aware, bye-bye, I'm aware that we've gone over time. I feel like it was a discussion that was needed and probably could continue but um, I don't know what the higher agreements are so (laughs) I feel like uh, we need to think about closing um, and also to close in a way that just calms the mind and, uh, and gives us a moment or two just to reflect on the sharing that happened so thank you very much to everybody it's been really rich